Hey, good morning. This is Meg Riley in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where we're gonna get another foot of snow this weekend to join the four feet that are already surrounding us. Oh, goody. <laughs> I'm starting to think about snowbirds and why they're snowbirds. Anyway, we have a lot to talk about. So let's move right to Asia Hauser. Hi, I'm Asia Hauser in Seattle, and I woke up to it starting to snow, and then I screamed loudly at the sky, and it's not snowing anymore. So I'm happy I'm that powerful. No, um, <laughs> it just stopped, and I am very happy about that. Dawn Fortune, you're in my home state where I grew up. How are you? I am well. I am happily ensconced in South Jersey. Um, where I serve our congregation at the UU Congregation of the South Jersey Shore in Galloway, a thriving little community of 110 souls um, who are taking on the world and doing social justice work down here in a very red corner of the state. Um, I don't- I'm, Michael. I'm on vacation, so I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do. Just for people who don't know, Dawn's a regular sub now, and since somebody always seems to be gone, Christina right now is on a college tour with child, Dawn is, is joining us today. And so that's great. I think you're a sub for the month, actually, if, if I have it right. So anyway, we're, we're thinking of you as a part of the team, yeah. Michael Tino, how is it? Good morning, everyone. Michael Tino here in beautiful sunny Peekskill, New York, where I hope you do not send us that snow because, you know, things move in this direction. Um, life is okay here, you know, it's, I, I, I exist in the, in the challenge that we all exist in this week. And the fires that I spent last week putting out have remained out, which is good. And Margali Belazaire, you are over there on the tech deck. You wanna say hi? Yes, yes, yes. Hello, Margalee. I will be on Facebook, um, just looking at your comments and posting them here for our panelists and hosts to respond to. I'm coming to you from actually pretty sunny a crumb. Well, no, today, where am I? Geez, I'm in so many places. <laughs> where am I today? I am in Cromwell. I'm in Cromwell, Connecticut. And um, it snowed a couple of days ago, but we're good. We're expecting more snow later today, but I'm really not complaining because it has been for us a fairly mild winter. So um, back to you, Meg. Great, thanks. Uh, we have a special guest today, Julica Herman de la Fuente. We're really excited to have you here talking about the value of covenant in anti-oppression work. And as we begin to talk about anti-oppression work, let's start with um, the heartbreaking story this week coming out from a UU World story, which was ignorantly and willfully placed despite recommendations from Alex Capitan from Trust, um, featuring the voice of a cisgender woman struggling to understand gender uh, in all kinds of ways that were painful for many, many people. So I'm curious how how a good covenant could have helped that from happening. But I did just want to name um, the pain of that. Also that late last night, it looked like Chris Walton came closer to a real apology than he did earlier in the day. And um, just open up for other people to talk about that a bit. It's been, it's been a really, really painful week. It's been a week when I'm delighted that my own gender non-conforming kid is not on Facebook to see how badly treated they might feel in this space. And we talked on the phone last night and I did not mention it because they already have enough to deal with. But, you know, it's, I mean, we're seeing all kinds of folks like Dawn who should be on vacation, spending a whole lot of time processing this and people writing really brilliant time consuming things without pay, you know, kind of the usual usual dynamics of the author of the article was clearly well paid for it or paid anyway. I don't know how well paid the world is, but you know, here we are again, and we've been here many times with many people. Um, so I open the floor on that. Um, one of the things that we talked about 
um, trust had a Zoom call last night to sort of just sort of gather ourselves and, and hold each other. Um, and one of the things I learned, which I was not aware of, is I mean, well, I knew that we were in the middle of search season, ministerial search season. Um, and I heard, and I don't have confirmation, but I heard that 10% of the people in search right now are gender nonconforming transgender ministers. And this has added a layer of angst and anxiety to their process. It has added a ton of work to what should be, you know, a three-day job interview, right? Um, and now they have to go in and explain why that wasn't appropriate and, and you know, all the things. And really they need to be doing the job interview. Um, it's like everybody that I've talked to in the past 24 to 48 hours has just simply been exhausted. Has simply been exhausted and, um, and feeling sort of banged up and bruised. Um, and it's, I guess the thing, and I'm speaking from my own understanding of trauma and complex PTSD, um, and there's the trauma of the action. There's the trauma of the words. There's the trauma of the thing. But there's another layer of that trauma when you learn of the betrayal when one of our members said, don't do this, it will hurt. And it was done anyway. You know, and if, if, if I'm in a room with somebody and I'm standing behind them and I say, look, you know, don't, don't back up, please. I'm standing here and you're going to step on me. Um, like if they did it by accident before I told them, oh, you know, oh, hey, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that. Won't happen again. But once I tell them that I'm there and that their actions are going to hurt and they do it anyway, not only is that assault, but it's betrayal. And it's a silencing. Um, and that's what it feels like. And it's just, um, for anyone who's a trauma survivor, um, particularly within families, that's not unlike what happens in really abusive family systems. And so what my experience has been is, um, a lot of adrenaline roller coaster stuff. You know, get an adrenaline blast um, and then crash and then get an adrenaline blast and then crash. And just the body is, I mean, that's just exhausting. You know, I had planned this week to bang on metal for fun. And instead, I spend a lot of time swearing at my computer um, and not getting to bang on metal. So. Um, What a covenant. Don't we have a covenant already? Like, what would a covenant do? I mean, we have one. We're a faith organization. We have mission statements. We have covenants. We have all of that stuff. Um, um, I, I guess, I don't know if, if having a better covenant would work or simply reminding ourselves and each other of our existing covenant, even when it's, especially when it's inconvenient and gets in the way of efficiency. I've been an editor. I worked as at the night desk of a small daily, you know, and, and that is meatball journalism, you know, that is just get it up, fill the page, move on. And so I understand how decisions get made under pressure. Um, and there's always, almost always, somebody in the newsroom who will say, hang on, we need to look at that. Um, and for really controversial issues, like if we are going to run, if we were going to run a story with um, a disturbing image of, 
an accident or a fire or um, some sort of thing where there were people or animals hurt, um, we would be very, very thoughtful in that decision-making process. That's not a decision that gets made on the night desk at 11. You know, that's a decision that has to be made in, in, in conversation and, and we did it. So I guess I don't know, I don't know what didn't happen, but I know it didn't. Um, and I know it made life complicated for trans and non-binary Unitarian Universalists um, in our association. That's all I got. White supremacy got centered. That's what happened. That's what the white supremacy teaching was all about, is whose voices get centered. And because we're, and I, I wrote a post yesterday, if somebody asked me to write about a white heterosexual cisgender man, I could write a super accurate article because that's, those are the stories we've been saturated with our entire lives. And so I, we, none of us, the world, no one asked for the perspective of a externally processing cisgender white woman because guess what? We hear that external processing, which is super painful in our brick and mortar congregations all the time, which is why folks get called in. Julika gets called in. I've been called in several times in congregations in the Seattle area to say, help us. And that's where to do it, not in our publication that gets mailed everywhere. And it's who we center. And that's part, and, that, and I'm so deeply, deeply Sorry isn't even adequate, Dawn. You and my trans siblings in spirit, I have so much love and compassion and pain. And um, I'm going to try to gather my cisgender folks. Like, cut this shit out. Cut it out. Cut it out. So I'm sorry. And I'm sorry that. And I do want. Thank you for all the emotional labor. And I'm, again, I'm, I'm going to stop saying I'm sorry. I love you. Thank you. I want to say something real quick, and that is the staff at the UU World made grave errors, and they are still our people. Um, you know, I about lunchtime yesterday, I was thinking to myself, I'm really glad I'm not Chris, Chris Walton today. You know, because and I'm not excusing, please understand, I'm not excusing this, but God, I've made dumb mistakes like that. He just did it on a huge stage, you know, and I think back of my early work in justice work and how badly and wrongly I've done it um, and how I've centered my own white voice you know, um, and so I, I'm not defending because the stuff I did was just as god awful and just as wrong. But um, there are things I've done that I wince about now, you know, and I did them a decade ago, and I'm just like, oh, if only. Um, and so let us remember that all persons have worth and dignity. Um, and, um, and ours is not a congreg ours is not a denomination that has a confession and, and penance sort of system. We have, um, um, I lost the word, um, accountability and, and a restorative justice sort of model, you know, where we acknowledge the hurt and then we work to make it right. We don't do three Hail Marys. You know, we don't tell it to a priest in a closet. We have to do our painful emotional work in public. Um, and having grown up Catholic, I will tell you that this way is way harder. This way is way harder. Um, so it's real easy to demonize individuals um, and my covenant reminds me that I'm not supposed to do that. So let's, let's please look at that when we have these conversations. You have to stay in relationship to do relational work. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's, that's pretty basic, right? 
Well, not only that, but everyone comes to these conversations at different developmental stages and capacities. So if we don't have a system that takes care of folks and educates them and brings them back into the into the conversation when they've failed as the way that we all fail, if we don't have those processes in place, then we're never going to live into what we're saying we want to be. I noticed Leslie Mack posted a really beautiful almost poem this morning about what apology means, um, which given that yesterday she said, I'm not doing any more emotional work. <laughs> it's like, oh, this is amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie Mack. But, you know, she was saying that in order to make a real apology, it can't just be what it needs. You need to internally grapple with why and not about my good intentions. You know, that's not the why. The why is, and Chris Walton almost says this, I valued the voice of cisgender people more than the voice of the people we were talking about. You know, he almost says that. And I hope that's what he's sitting with himself and really thinking about. And God knows, Dawn, we've all made ridiculous. And, and not like 10 years ago, like today. I mean, you know, and we can't do this work without making mistakes constantly. I think Ashley Haran's always saying, we can either do this work imperfectly or not do this work, you know? So if we want to do the work, you know, we're gonna be... I mean, that's why I was so grateful for this beautiful post about apology. We're going to have to really, uh, those of us with a lot to apologize for, are going to have to really learn what that means, not in a paying our dues kind of way, but in a soul level, who do I want to be and how do I want to be kind of way. And it's, it's so painful, as you were saying, Don, to get in touch with the harm that we've done to real people. Hearing you describe the trauma in your body, you know, hearing you describe what this means for people in search in an already exhausting three days to have this extra huge layer, which already would have been an extra layer, but it's like the more foot of snow coming here, you know, like on top of all, you know, it's so I think um, really feeling the impact of what we do. And for me, the you know, that has to become more painful than my own little story that I tell myself, you know, so, yeah. Margalee, you've been quiet so far. You wanna chime in anything here? Yes, I was thinking as you all were talking about the idea of how we've said when we, when, as we do this work, we, we know it's gonna be messy and that it's gonna be, um, a little chaotic and that we also say that we we want to make space for that mess. Um, of course, all sides have to, um, or uh, the, the side that has injured has to own that, um, you know, but I, I guess I, I was just thinking about that, the, um, what we, how we say we want to do this work, that this mess is going to happen. Now, what do we do now that this mess has happened? Do we um, villainize those that have perpetrated this hurt? Um, do we focus first on taking care of those who have been hurt? You know, what, what, what do we do? Um, and I really, I'm just thinking, I'm not even thinking that anybody can answer any of this, but as you all were, uh, talking, those were the things that were coming to mind for me, that this is, here's this mess that we say is going to happen. It is right now, it is happening. So what, what, what do we do with it? Um, so, yeah. Well, I should introduce our special guest at this point, which I haven't done. I, I said I was glad you were here, but uh, Julica Herman de la Fuente is an anti-racism coach and trainer at large for UUs. I know that you're working with a lot of clergy at this point and maybe other religious professionals. So why don't you start by just describing the context of your work and then I bet you've dealt with a lot of messes. <laughs> I'm willing to bet. Thank you, Meg. Yeah. Uh, so I 
um, I'm doing work with, re with religious educators, with ministers. I do this as a coach. I come and do trainings for groups of people who want to have conversations about anti-racism, anti-oppression. I've been doing this since I was 21. I fell into this work before I discovered Unitarian Universalism, but uh, Unitarian Universalism has become the container for me to do this work because I have not met a group of people more committed to figuring this out than you use. And that's why I stay. You know, like th there are days where I'm like, I'm doing this because I don't know why I'm doing this. I should be making costumes. That's really what I love to do. But I have this call to, to help and to leverage the intersection of my identities, which um, puts me often more, more often than not on a bridge place. And that bridge space gives me the opportunity to, to meet people who have the privileged identities and help them do the work of staying in the work and not being shriveled up in, in shame and fragility, but then also reaching out to people in the marginalized um, experience and helping us claim that we're not going to put up with nonsense anymore and how are we going to free our own souls and what does it mean like one of the one of the things that i've been doing recently is how do i decolonize my own soul it's been very powerful for me to recognize how much time i've spent doing the assimilation game and getting all the right credentials and not giving anyone any reason to um question my capacity or my authority or my capability and now i'm on the other side of the assimilation game and i'm like not so much we're gonna do this a little differently now so that's my own personal work by way of saying that we people of color i'm mexican i'm a mexican immigrant we people of color um, also have our work and we are so focused on taking care of the people with privilege whether that's cis or white or male or straight that we don't recognize oh yeah i'm supposed to be doing something here over here with me how am i what do i need um awkward segue into the into the covenant piece i feel like part of the issue is that in our anti-racism work and you've heard me say this before i think even here um we focus so much on the individual work on the demonstrating that i am not racist and i am not homophobic and i am not part of the problem that we don't look at our systems we don't look at our processes and covenant is one of our core processes. Like, what are we, how are we going to actually do this? Because Margali, what you just said is, is exactly right. Like the mess is gonna happen. How are we gonna hold the mess? What is the container for the mess? Well, the truth is most people are still pretending like the mess doesn't happen here. We are not part of the problem. We are progressive. We are accepting. We are the chosen. The frozen chosen and we're <laughs> we're not we're, we're not part of the problem when in fact we haven't even started doing some of the work and helping each other get into the work and create the right containers is i think what a good covenant can do because i actually don i know that you said we have a covenant but we don't live into our covenants we don't you want to unmute yourself and say a thing yeah, thank you. Yeah, we, we have mm, we have a covenant and we treat it the same way we treat our uh, welcoming congregation sticker in that we treat it like a merit badge and we've achieved it and there we, we put it on our sign and we're good. Um, and there's another piece to that. And I think this really goes to the phenomenon that Robin D'Angelo talked about in White Fragility and that is that we don't know how to be imperfect. We, we, we are not skilled at making mistakes. We are not skilled at failing. You know, I think about Sean Dennison's, um, whatchamacallit lecture. Very Somebody straight, knows. it was That's so it. good. Thank you, yeah, right? And, and it's funny, because I, I, I had this great mug that I got at GA, when we were in New Orleans, I went over to Mississippi to the little NASA place, right? And it's this mug that says, failure is not an option. And, and I wanna write under it, it's a guarantee, you know? Because that's what Sean said, is, is it's gonna happen. But for some reason, we think it's not gonna happen to us, which, you know, in psychology is called magical thinking and we expect it of 16 year olds. 
Um, and when it does, we simply freeze up because we have we have no skills, no muscle memory, no no coping skills to acknowledge our own imperfection. And and so that's one of the things that I think is a biggest stumbling block for us. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah I, I, go ahead, Meg. Sorry. Well, I think that you know individually that's true and systemically that's true so i'm thinking of this little congregation that i'm in part-time and um if if they were to perceive failure there which i'm not seeing that they do but if they were it would be really a, pro a huge problem for them and they would want to blame somebody for it <laughs> probably the ministers but it could be someone else you know if there were you know if there were somebody of a marginalized group say, saying that it wasn't working for them, it could be that person. But whoever says there's a problem here, um, if you're not willing to say, this place is, is rife with problems and always will be, we're human, that's life. Um, it, it would, it, that doesn't land there is what I see. There's just a desire to, to rise above that. And, to, and that, so that turns to blame, the shame and the blame are just, <laughs> Yep, scapegoating, like you just said, Aisha, in the chat. That's right. It's a scapegoating game. I mean, that, that well, having been the one scapegoated everywhere I go, um, and, and I will own when I make a mistake. I had to do that this week, as a matter of fact. Um, it's so, so the shame, so, so I'm really part of my work. And I've said this, although I, I offended at least one white person who said it was condescending. I said, one of the things I've learned is how much pastoral care white people need because I've now likened white liberals to the Truman Show. They're Truman who think the world was a certain way and then Trump got elected and, the, and for you use the white supremacy teaching happened. And they're kind of like, wait a minute, this is not the world we know. And so um, I'm trying, I, I, I'm working on having more empathy and compassion because I can imagine that that's a scary place. And I still say, we still have a problem here and we have to stop doing harm. We have to, let's first, I did a bystander training last night and somebody said, well, what's the goal? And I said, the goal is stop harm first. First, the goal, it's not, we're not looking right now to what to do with the perpetrator. The first goal before, or stopping harm, then there are steps after that. And so as a faith community, because that's what I say to people, we're not a club, we're a faith community and they operate differently. And it is, it behooves us to be in the mess because the mess is not uh, singular. It's not an aberration, it's the norm. And do no harm, do less harm, mitigate harm. And when you do harm, own it and learn to do better and understand why that harm happened. And you're right, Meg, uh, Leslie's post is poetic. Um, so, I was thinking, Michael, are you going to say something? No. I was thinking about um, covenants, preparing for this conversation, and, and thinking there's like a, a moment where the covenant bifurcates, and it either goes to support the status quo, or it goes to challenge it. And that's what I was hoping to to externally process with you all. I mean, I, I was really glad that Margalee invited me to this conversation because I am in the middle of figuring this out. I'm not, I don't have it. I wanna massage it. And, and so what I, the place where it goes to support the status quo is a covenant that assumes we're all good here. And many of us use the phrase, we assume good intentions in our covenanting, right? Like that, 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 Every, that everything that happens is going to happen with a good intention. And I have seen a pivot in the way that we covenant in some spaces that I think makes a big difference where we say impact is more important than intention. We're going to focus on the impact. We're going to center the folks on the margins. We're going to figure out how to reduce the harm, what you were just saying, Aisha. But I think that many of our covenants are still a little more resonant of a time when when it was about clubs the club of the white male ministers and the club of the the club of this congregation and like and and so the we 
creating the covenant was homogenous. Like we all have the same amount of power. We all have a, a, the same lived understanding of the world. And so we don't have to navigate any of that because th that won't show up. So I think the covenant that goes the other direction where it's the first container to do anti-racism work effectively requires an analysis of power and a willingness to name that some people in this room have more power than others. And how are we going to deal with that? So. I don't know. What do you think? Well, you know, it, it's interesting, Julika. Um, as many people are aware, and some people are probably not, the Ministers Association has has a covenant. And uh, the parts of it that get quoted most often, because I think the Ministers Association covenant does both of those things that you just said in parts, like if depending on which part you read. And the parts that get quoted most often are the parts that reinforce the status quo um, <laughs> and shut people up and tone police uh, marginalized folks. Um, and there are other parts of the covenant about awareness of power differential and anti-oppression work that people don't quote. I, I, I keep that part, I keep it in a note on my phone so that when people start quoting the we don't speak derogatorily of one another in public part of it, I post that. Like I just, I copy and paste it. Um, and it's, it's, it's a note on my phone, like pinned to the top of my notes. Because and it's you sad. need it that often. <laughs> <laughs> I need it that often. Um, yeah. So, you know, I think sometimes covenants do both of those. <laughs> they, they, they challenge the status quo and they uphold it. And, and we need to tease out which parts do what? Well, and I don't think our covenants are specific enough yet. So like, for example, in Facebook space, like in groups, the person that needs to figure something out, I'm gonna, I, I have a question about whether, is this racist? Am I allowed to do this? So there's a person that's like wanting to figure something out with good intentions. There's good intentions. I am posting this question to learn, but where do you pose the question? Do you pose it in a caucus space where other people are gonna help you out in your development? Or do you pose it in a space where the question itself is injurious? We don't have a covenant yet where we say, when we do this work, we will do it over here. When you make a mistake and start doing it somewhere else, someone is lovingly gonna scoop you up and put you in the caucus space. And, and do we trust caucus space? Are we ready for like, I, you know, I, I wonder myself if I'm ready to let all the white people go do their work without me watching because I kind of want to keep an eye on them like that's embarrassing to say but it's true like I, I'm a, I also I'm a control freak. So I don't like we haven't we have not fleshed out our covenant. And the other thing is we're really good at making the covenant, but then we don't make time to live into it like we don't make time to review it. We don't check in about it. It just exists. It's now a document. So the board has a covenant. Every board has a covenant and maybe they read it. But when the covenant gets broken, then what? Like what are our processes for, for, for injury? And I think it is about restorative justice, but we don't have a habit of restorative justice. Restorative justice is not the norm and I want it to be the norm, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I had a question about just this um, in a, a UU history class that I was teaching in my congregation this past week. I was explaining the, the Cambridge platform, which every minister will sort of go, ow. Um, but it's this magnificent document upon which our fiercely independent, horribly dysfunctional independence slash unaccountability slash you're not the boss of me culture comes from. And when I was talking with them, I, I described the original document as, as saying, look, nobody's in charge of anybody, but when we see our neighbor behaving badly, we as a collective are obligated to bring them back into right relationship, to, to stop if, Back then, the, 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 one of the major concerns was if the minister was drinking, 
if the minister was, if, if something was happening and the congregation was, was behaving badly as a whole or, or was suffering in some way, it was, the whole point of it was that we would help one another in good and bad behaviors. And not only do we not know how to do that as congregations, we don't know how to do this as, as individual people. Because it's, it, it, it states those things in the Cambridge platform, but it doesn't tell you how to do it. Thank you for that. I, I struggle so much with interrupting. I, I don't know. I know not you, Aisha. <laughs> not all of us are as fearless as you, honey. <laughs> No, that's right. I mean, you don't have that problem, but I do because I have assimilated and I, I, I want to be a good girl. When I show up to spaces, I want to get the A. I want to be the A student and, and do things right. And I don't want, and it's also my family system shit. Like I don't want to disrupt. I don't want to make people uncomfortable. I go out of my way to take care of white people. I notice and I'm super gentle about how I lift up feedback and what and sometimes I'm letting my colleagues of color pay the price because I am I don't have the courage to say yo cut that shit out right now like stop now and I think so one of the things that I notice is if I'm facilitating if I'm in the front of the room I have no problem holding containers and saying yes you may no you may not stop that shit whatever you know like that I'm, I'm okay with that part, but when I'm a participant in a room, I, I don't always give myself the authority to interrupt and to, and to say, this is not helpful. I don't know, I don't know how, to, how to build that muscle for myself. I, I, I think it is about covenants and uh, practice, but Aisha, you know, go. Well, it's not, so after, um... We talked about this on The View a couple of years ago, or maybe a year ago, I don't know when it was. Loretta had, I was one of the people that stood up and said to two white men, stop it. So I got a call shortly after that from a Loretta chapter that said, can you do a webinar and teach us how to do that? And I said, here's the thing. You can't go from zero to 80 if you are uncomfortable even having a conflict in your own family or in your own congregation, or you can't have a difficult conversation. So what I did do was create a webinar based on a book that I did not write. I wish I did. It's, a, it's even respectful of your time. It's called Honest, Direct, Respectful. It's about this thin. Um, and I did a, a whole PowerPoint on it. And I now I say to folks, learn how to deal with conflict because the, that's a way to build the muscles. Having the difficult conversations is naming things one-on-one. -on -one. Because I, at 20, I was, I was exactly like that, Julika. I was it wasn't until my mother disowned me at 20 and then I made this life choice where I'm like, what bigger conflict is there than your family walking away from you? And I didn't see her for 16 years. So it's, it's part of it is building a resilience muscle and continually. And then I could stand up in a room full of 200 people and tell two white men to stop it. Um, but I'm 48. I mean, this didn't come easily to me at 20. And it is, and this is what I, this is the gift of our faith community of Unitarian Universalism. Let's have a difficult conversation. Let's call each other in. Let's learn to apologize and atone. There I use that word. How do you make amends? How do you say, how can I make this right? And good intentions are a low bar. So I ask everyone to stop it. So we talk about impact. Thank you. That, thank you for coming to my TED Talk. No. I, uh, I Go ahead, Margali. I was um, thinking about, you know, when when um, it seems almost like the covenant, the covenant, the different covenants we have um, protects, and maybe that's not the right word, protects the person who causes the injury, and then punishes the injured when they come in because they didn't go about. Um, doing, they didn't go about it the right way. They didn't approach the person who injured them the right way. And so they've broken covenant. So it seems like the focus is always, um, it's almost always on the injured who is then having to, um, you know, take care of themselves and still have to take care in how they approach the person who's injured them. And I think to me, that is the biggest problem with our covenant because the person who's do, done the injury there really is no accountability 
um, on their part sometimes um, because they've done it. And so the other person has done something now the focus is on them. So, you know, so how, what, what do you say about that? There is a really great chapter in a book that I don't know the title of, but maybe we can post it somewhere later. It, the, the chapter name is From Safe Spaces to Brave Spaces. And I want to very quickly name that there are some of our siblings in the dis disabled community really dislike the word brave because that's a word that gets leveraged at them all the time. So it's an unfortunate choice of word in that sense. So I, try, I talk about bold spaces or risky spaces, but the, but the core of the idea of this chapter is that when we make agreements focusing on the comfort of the people with with privileged identities, we're creating a safe space. And learning doesn't happen in a safe space. And it's not a good promise to make that the space is going to be safe. A long time ago, I used to say there's a difference between comfort and safety. I want you to feel safe, but uncomfortable. And I would try to make that distinction. But more and more, I'm feeling like, I don't know if I can even promise safe because the other thing that's true and that you that I've said before is that white fragility is real. It's really obnoxious, but the the experience of my heart beating really fast, I'm not feeling well, is an actual physiological experience that someone is feeling unsafe. Like in the moment when they are being challenged, their privilege is being challenged, they legitimately feel unsafe. Well, legitimately, maybe that's not the right word, but they actually have a physical experience. So how do we handle that? And I think it's about saying, this is going to happen. When this happens, we're going to do this, this, and this. Um, I also want to share a story about, I was in a training for the program leaders of the College of Social Justice. And it is the one time that I have been in Unitarian Universalist space where it was a multiracial space with more than 50% of the people, people of color. And the dynamics in that room were totally different. So when we set the covenant, that was one of the places where I became, fell back in love with covenanting because of the way that we did the covenant that day. Because um, one of my colleagues, the Reverend Kimberly Quinn Johnson, um, was fabulous and brave and said, um, when someone said, we assume good intentions, she's like, no, we don't. <laughs> because people don't always have good intentions. And I jumped on that and I was like, yes. Let's go there. Like, let's go to a place where we actually create a space where we're treating each other with certain expectations and understandings of power. And it was a completely different covenant and process and space for those three days where we were centering the needs of the people of color. And we changed the agenda based on what was happening in the room. But that doesn't usually happen. That's the, that's, that was like a glimpse of the, the Unitarian Universalism I want to live in, but not the one that I usually inhabit. I've been thinking a lot um, about individual versus institutional in terms of, you know, in terms of covenant, in terms of apology and amends and, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And, um, you know, I posted on Facebook earlier today uh, something and and uh about what's going on and uh in with the uu world and the apologies that have been released and uh people are like, oh but people apologized and they were pretty good apologies they acknowledged what they did and uh and my response was that i'm losing faith in our institutional ability uh to to let to to change so that so, so that those apologies can be made real, um, that those apologies can be lived out. And I, and I think, you know, my, I, I, I'm thinking out loud, right? Ex extrovert in external processor right here. Um, <laughs> uh, I just, I wonder how covenant can help the institution create the space so that we can do better together. You know, I've, I've just, I've seen it so many times you know, I, when I was in seminary, Meadville Lombard Theological School was going through a whole um, process of grappling with the racism in its past, um, mostly spurred by students of color who were my colleagues um, at the time. And uh, they, were, they were doing this 
un understanding what they did, what, what had gone wrong and apologizing for it. And then in the next breath saying, but academic freedom says we can't tell our professors that they have to include non-white authors in their syllabi. <laughs> Yeah, like the freedom of right. the pulpit, the freedom right. of whatever, all of those. And protecting you know, and, freedom is one of the ways that this gets complicated. And people are like, well, the UU world is an independent press. And I'm like, yeah, that's kind of BS in my mind. And, you know, what are the institutional things, the white supremacists, patriarchal cis supremacist institutional things that are going to stop any apology from actually becoming amends that are real, that are tangible. You know, Dawn said, but my arm is still broken and will take time to heal. But like, you know, if the institution is stopping anyone from putting a cast on your arm, it's not just time, right? <laughs> right, if there's like a policy in place that says we will not put a cast on anyone's arm, then there's something broken that's bigger than, than, than what any individual can fix. I hear what you're saying about about losing faith in the institutions, but I actually have the opposite experience, which is that I feel like we have different people in leadership now who are wanting to find the institutional fixes and are are looking and I you know and I do I, I saw this morning that Chris Walton had a these are our next steps and those next steps looked actionable to me. Like I want to see if they do it. But if they do it, then that does feel a little better than just so sorry. Like, this is how we're not going to do it again. And we're going to have this kind of editors and we're going to do this. And, but I don't know. I mean, it's still centering like the 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 we need to get farther up the river, I think, so that it's so that it's not happening. Don, I saw you say saying something. Say it again. <laughs> yes, I was I was grumbling. Um... The promises made were stuff that should have been baseline to begin with. Like, I don't feel like giving somebody a parade for taking out the trash. Yeah, there's no cookies here. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's your damn job. Like, like if you want to impress me, go above and beyond. Don't right. just don't just do what you should have been doing all along. That you don't get a star for that. Right. You know, show me, show me something proactive, show me something really far reaching and then I might be impressed, especially if you try to do it. But this is just, we're going to take these steps that we sh that should have been policy all along. And, and I also just want to lift up that I looked through the UU world, this edition, and I saw one person who wrote who might be a person of color. Oh, yeah. Every other piece written in house was written by a white person. No, there's there's no doubt there's a pattern here. I mean, so my, that that needs to be where it starts. Yeah, absolutely. We the Latinx professionals wrote a letter to the UU world saying, um, what happened with our Thursday morning worship at GA last year? Like that kind of didn't get covered. How did what? So no, absolutely. But I, I want that, I want to talk about like, so what is that more proactive thing? Because like, I, I really appreciate my colleagues who have privilege where I don't. So like my white colleagues and my male colleagues who say, I'm going to do better. And I also say it myself as a cisgender, temporarily able-bodied person, I'm going to do better. But I'm not doing better. Like I haven't done anything different. I just... I just carry on until the next shit show and then I amplify the voices and I say this is so terrible and I'm so sorry this happened I'm gonna do better. And I'm still not doing better and I don't feel like like we're not changing like what what well, I don't know what I'm saying anymore somebody say a thing. I, I, I get a thought but what and what I hear you talking about with relation to gender stuff is what I challenge myself with with racial stuff. And that is, it, it starts at home. How many people come to my house and hang out with me who are not white, queer, trans, butch? Oh, oops, right? So I have to intentionally go places 
and not intrude, not invade, but put myself in places that are intentionally multicultural, intentionally multiracial, intentionally diverse, and I need to reach out and ask people about themselves because that's how you make friends, right? And so I need to diversify my own friends. And we can say our congregations are getting more diverse, but if you ask anybody in our congregations, how many of the people of color in your congregation have been in your house, have come over for dinner, and not just the annual summer pool party that you throw for everybody, but I mean, you know, come on over, your kids and my kids are an owl, let's hang out, right? So that's what we need to do. Cisgender people need to broaden the gender perspective, the gender array of their friendships. White people need to broaden the racial array of our friendships. And that means we need to be uncomfortable. Yeah. I appreciate the way that you framed it just now, because at the beginning, like when you were saying we need more diverse friendships, I actually need to assimilate less and have less white people in my life. I need to right. know, yeah. I need yeah, yeah, yeah. with my people yeah. of color because I don't have enough of them. Um, but I but and, and but the, but but I, and if I can just keep struggling out loud with you, Don, I have a lot of trans friends, dear ones, like dear personal. That's not enough. That's not enough. Like. I get it. I do the pronoun thing for the most part. Okay. Like whatever, but that's not, I'm talking about up river, like what you just described about, like, I'm not going to give you cookies for doing what you're supposed to be doing. I want right. you to be super proactive. What does that look like institutionally is what I want to know. I think institutionally, that means everybody looks, does the stuff that you're doing because it's normal for you. Yeah. But I, I got news for you, hon. <laughs> you're, you're not normal in that sense. Well, we already in, knew that. <laughs> <laughs> within our, but within our denomination, what's normal for you is really beyond most people's reality. Meg, I interrupted. Yeah, Go ahead. Well, I had a question. I'm really curious because you're like the third person of color I know who's described that UUSC gathering in the covenant in those terms, that it was a liberating covenant. So I'm curious, what was there anything there that you could learn from for other settings? Or was it because of who was in the room relationally to create that, that it was so liberating? Thank you. Um, I think that the College of Social Justice staff picked a bunch of people who were already doing a lot, like very intentional in how we engage this work. So I think even those of us with marginalized identities weren't bleeding wounds at the time, like weren't in, weren't in trauma, but were at a level of um, functionality and uh, well-being. And I think having each other there and having the sense of there's more than one of me. Like that's the one time I've been in a room where there was more than one immigrant, more than one Mexican person, more than one, you know, like usually, even if I'm in a community of people of color, I'm usually the only something. And that time I wasn't. And that was really freeing just in a way of being. But I, I we actually have that document. I need to pull it up and, and look at what it was that we said. But what it but what what it did that was different is it centered power and power differentials and it named that the people who with more marginalized identities have more say as to how things are going to go. They, that, that there was a sense of um, here, here's, here's the thing. Very seldom do I experience people with privilege committing to being humble in their covenants. I think that the, the, the covenant is usually about protecting themselves, protecting, making sure that I'm going to be as comfortable as I can. But when, when people with privilege, and in this case, my male and white colleagues in that space said, I, 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 I come humbly. I'm so sorry you're going to school me. I, I will try to minimize the times that you do that. There was a very different energy in the room already. And it gave me more uh, gratitude and grace 
for mistakes and willingness to say, not so much like that, but maybe more like that. Or I agree with what you're saying and I would like to add this other thing, or I really disagree with what you're saying. Like there was a, a different way of being in the room. But it's been a couple of years, so I, I and I have perimenopause brain. I don't remember that much more than that. Yeah, I know. Perimenopause brain is no joke. And I say it out loud all the time because we pretend like that shit isn't going on. And I'm like, what? Anyway, a whole other topic. You can have me back for that one. There is a reason why hormones are a controlled substance. Well. Right? Just yes. remember that. Remember that. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Did I answer your question, Meg? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm really... Um excited by the energy that people have when they talk about that. It's sort of the same energy I see when people come from a blue revival or something. And I'm like, there's life, there's life in the faith, there it is, you know, so I'm, I'm really curious and um, excited about it. And um, we've got four out of nine people on the CLF board now. And I'm really happy about that. I think, as we keep, you know, shifting numbers make a difference you know they really do and when there's always the one you know the one person it's just so hard I want to tell everybody who's watching that we haven't been saying everything you've been saying it's not because poor Margaret Lee has not been sharing it with us she's been bringing it over here but I think we've all been kind of in thinking mode here and that's such a gift of yours Julica to to ask the questions in such a way that invite people into them and this is such compelling questioning. Aisha, you've been a little bit quiet for you. You got anything to say before we end today? I feel like I gave like mini TED talks. So I just, I was enthralled with the conversation. I always love um, hearing from uh, Julica and Dawn. Um, Finding Our Way Home is next week, the largest ever. We're gonna be in Miami. I'm gonna see Julica Margali there and I'm one of the planners. It's gonna be amazing. 140 religious professionals of color will be in Miami. So I'm very and, happy about that. And, I'm and, super I, and I didn't get invited to it this year. No, me, nope. Which is great. Nope. I Stop fixed it. the list, Michael. I no. fixed the list. <laughs> Stop it. Um, <laughs> did you get invited? Is that, a, is that real? You got an invitation? Uh, it, uh, for, for basically the first eight years of my ministry. And every year I sent an email saying, I'm white, but thank you. I was the president uh, no. of ARE and I would get invitations. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, you know, I'm like the head white person. So next week, we're having a white show. We're going to talk with Dr. Sharon Welch about what white people with power can do with their power. So, you know how people have these white ah. dinners and everyone wears white. This is going to be our white show next week. And hopefully we'll be really uncomfortable. <laughs>Thanks for coming. I'm, I'm really, um, I, though we didn't get to pull comments in, I'm really heartened to see so many people wrestling and really thinking deeply and struggling with the kinds of questions that Julika raised about how we, how we get up river even a few feet and we're not constantly going down river and then trying to fight our way back to where we were. And I don't even know if that's a good metaphor for this, but you know, it's, it's heartening to me the number of people I also want to put in one last plug for the trust ask for money. It's getting close to the $12,000 that they're asking for. So people, someone mentioned a while back that all the people doing great writing should have been compensated. And, you know, maybe the UU world will do that. But meanwhile, we can all chip in a little bit what we've got to help uh, trust do its great work. And we can I also are offer working a on tangible it. idea, Meg, real quick? There are religious Ooh. educators who are printing CB bills um our note on facebook and putting it in the um the print magazines in their congregations with the uh, yeah so that there's there we're just kind of physically doing it so that's an idea for folks yeah i think those if you're gonna do that maybe you can like paypal cb some cash because they didn't get paid for that Yeah, and those of us in congregations, I think, um, we'll be thinking of all kinds of ways to try to lower the damage from that article as we yeah. go into this Sunday. So thanks, everybody. See some of you next time, those of you on the road. It'll be warm in Miami. <laughs> Enjoy it. Take care. Be well.